start with uh, the essential components of the digital workplace presented by my colleague Ricardo Hamilton, which is a Microsoft 365 expert at CTG. Then we speak a bit about our added value, what we can propose to our customers, what we think is really important around the digital workplace. And I will let uh, Dr. Axel Koster uh, which is a uh, storage uh, chief uh, technologist at IBM or partner, uh, presents what we think is really an added value to those services, so complementary solution uh, to the digital workplace, and mainly IB IBM uh, cloud satellites, spectrum fusion, and spectrum sales uh, scale. Uh, if you have any question, you have the chat. Don't hesitate to ask us a lot of questions, or you can contact us directly uh, after this meeting, uh, we will uh, try to uh, answer, I would say, the most <laughs> question we can at the end of uh, those presentations. Uh, and first, I will let my colleague Ricardo start uh, speaking about the digital workplace itself. Ricardo. Thank you, Fono. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for attending this webinar. Uh, we're very excited to present uh, Digital Workplace by CTG. Uh, first of all, we'd like to focus mainly on the, the components that make up a successful digital workplace, which is, as it's highlighted here, employee, creativity, and productivity. So uh, a successful digital workplace is centered around the employee, and to have that uh, a successful digital workplace deployed, you need to ensure that the employee is at the forefront of the deployment of a digital workplace. And thus, if the employee doesn't uh, buy in or, or um, adhere to uh, a digital workplace transformation, then the organization can't transcend digitally either. Then there's creativity. By having easy access to the modern tools like um, Office and Word and Excel and PowerPoint and these applications, uh, employees are encouraged and empowered to be innovative and bring new ideas and solutions to the organization. Uh, with productivity, the ability to work from anywhere at any time, but still be connected to each other, employees are now more than ever have that flexibility to work and do more if necessary. Um, digital transformation has been in the roadmap for a number of companies for some years now. And um, we all know with regards to the COVID-19 pandemic that has drastically accelerated um, those, um, those uh, movements to have uh, digital transformation in the workplace. And I think we should all be really proud of ourselves in the way in which we reacted to the COVID-19 pandemic in terms of implementing um, chat applications or meeting applications and providing the tools for users to continue to work from home or wherever they are. Uh, but that's not the end of having a digital workplace. We need to ensure that the user experience is of utmost importance um, by having users having that flexibility to work from anywhere having centralized access to content and data, and also easy access to tools. We think automation is also really important in having a successful digital workplace. The em employee onboarding process should be seamless, and also the deployment of applications to users and user devices and, and mobile app, uh, devices should be really smooth and automatic. Uh, device management is also key. Uh, now that users are working from home and, and different locations, we need to ensure that those devices can be managed remotely by the IS department. Security also is very important for us at CTG as well. And with users working from multiple locations, we need to ensure that the identities of those users are secured. Um, secure documents and data, of course, and also device security. Now, we want to know how we are going to emphasize or implement a digital workplace. Um, as a Microsoft partner, CTG has decided to align ourselves with the direction that Microsoft is heading with regards to having a, a successful digital workplace. Using tools like enterprise mobility and security, we have components like Intune, Azure Information Protection and Conditional Access. For collaboration, we have Exchange Online, Microsoft Teams, SharePoint, and OneDrive for Business. And with Windows 10, we have Windows Defender and Windows Virtual Desktop. 
For enterprise, enterprise mobility and security and identity and access management, we ensure secure connections between people, devices, apps, and data. So people who are sending and receiving data are legitimate by securing user, the user identities. Information protection to ensure sensitive data is protected with sensitive delabels and DLP policies. Uh, data can be encrypted before leaving the organization or restricted from being sent accidentally or otherwise. And for device management and app deployment, you need to ensure corporate devices, desktops, laptops, tablets, and mobile devices are managed and that the data is protected on those devices. So devices can be BitLocker encrypted and apps are deployed on the company portal and installed by the employees or silently installed without user interruption. For collaboration, we have secured reliable email anywhere through Exchange Online. In traditional environments, you would only have access to your emails at, at your office locations or over a VPN client. Uh, with Microsoft Teams, which to me arguably is the most uh, collaborative application in the entire Microsoft 365 platform, and it incorporates a lot of all these other different uh, tools around it. And you can meet, chat, and collaborate and share with persons internally, internally in your organization and as well with external stakeholders. Uh, with SharePoint, you can co-author documents. In, in traditional environments, you normally have a, a internal file share where you would share documents, but you won't have that ability to edit a document if it's open by someone else. And then you would have to constantly email documents back and forth to each other. But with SharePoint Online, you have that ability to co-author and work on documents at the same time together. And with OneDrive and SharePoint as well, we need to ensure that securely documents are securely saved and uh, files. when files are being shared, uh, you can specify the respective permissions on those, on those files so that the intended recipient has the, the proper rights to access that file or folder. With Windows 10, we have integrated security with Windows Defender, which is embedded into the operating system and relays information to the Endpoint Defender Management Center. Simplified updates. Now we're taking away the responsibility from the end user to ensure that the devices are up to date and they're, they're going ahead and installing updates on their devices by managing the automatic updates from a centralized console. With multi-session Windows 10, we have fully managed desktop virtual solution in the cloud. The good news is it works with all your apps and devices, full feature apps for Windows, Mac, and iOS, and can be accessed on any browser. The solution is separate from your data and apps and from your local hardware. And the main appeal is that you can separate compute environment from your users, making the risk of confidential information being left on a personal device greatly reduced. Now, the benefits of having a successful uh, effective digital workplace are uh, increased flexibility and flexibility not only with regards to the user's work environment, but also with the user's work schedule. With users having access to all their tools on a mobile device, users can connect from anywhere, which gives a good work-life balance. Reduce operation costs. Um, of course, we all, we're human beings and human interaction is, is really great sometimes. And, and I agree for me as well, meeting in person is really cool, but sometimes it makes sense to have meetings virtual, virtually. And um, that ultimately can reduce the operation costs in terms of travel um, in long-term office space and furniture as well. Improve productivity with features like calendar sharing and Microsoft Teams from, for keeping up to date with uh, the status of meetings and projects. Project can be, can be completed faster. And also having intuitive applications, users can spend more time to focus on actually working and not trying to figure out how the applications work. Enhanced communication and innovation. A properly constructed digital workplace allows communication to flow seamlessly among stakeholders, which empowers employees to suggest ideas and solutions effectively. Improve security. At Microsoft, they have dedicated security experts constantly monitoring the environment to ensure that the data is secured there. And also something that we take for granted a lot is perimeter security. 
um, the physical security at Microsoft data centers is very stringent and um, access to, to your data um, is, is not, uh, there's, there's a number of different security checkpoints at Microsoft data centers to ensure that the right personnel who are interacting with the data centers are authorized. And Microsoft 365 also targets companies of all sizes. So whether you're an organization of less than 300 employees or an enterprise organization, there is a Microsoft 365 solution for you. Now we know, we at CTG know that a lot of companies have applications that are required to be hosted, whether that's public or private cloud. But for that, I'll put you back on to my colleague, Kono, who's gonna take you through uh, what we have for uh, cloud hosting. Thank you very much, Ricardo. So speaking about uh, hosting applications, so we have all uh, centralized application, I would say that we have to host for several reasons, database, etc., that are not uh, really uh, uh, adapted to have a local application on your desktop. So for that, we have several solutions. Uh, we can uh, we can speak, Ricardo. We can speak about a uh, public cloud solution using uh, Amazon Web Services or Microsoft Azure to host your application. We have several consultants that are using those solutions and it's reintegrated with ours. And we can speak as well with our private cloud uh, solution because yeah, <laughs> we are in Luxembourg. A lot of you are probably working for a PSF company. We know that uh, that are important and we want solution that are local for our customers. So I won't go through details, especially uh, because uh, if we want to speak about uh, solutions, uh, I think my uh, uh, partner from uh, IBM will uh, give you uh, interesting information about the uh, new uh, new hardware, new software that you can uh, have uh, in uh, 2021 on the market. But uh, I will just highlight the fact that uh, we renew all our infrastructure. We are fully BM with server storage and AS400 uh, um, servers. Uh, it's into a redundant uh, data center tier four, and we have a redundant uh, network infrastructure to interconnect uh, everything. And now I will go uh, into what uh, what I call uh, added value on the digital workplace, because you know it's it's really good to speak about the component, uh, uh, IT component, technical component, etc. But uh, what is a really added value, and uh, that's what we think at CTG, it's the support and the governance. Uh, speaking about the support, we have two kinds of support. The first one is the remote support. So if we speak about re remote support here at CTG, we are doing uh, uh, support uh, uh, for more than 10 years now in Luxembourg. And uh, we are delivering uh, support uh, with 100 agents uh, in Luxembourg in 24 by seven, six languages, we have definitely the appropriate solution regarding uh, uh, your setup, your configuration, and your size. Uh, this is great if you are PSF because uh, you need to have uh, people uh, in Luxembourg uh, to support your your business application. But what is great as well is that uh, CTG is a group, and uh, thanks to the group, we uh, uh, made uh, made it, uh, made this year uh, a real follow the sun solution with service desk in Bogota and uh, Colombia and Hyderabad in uh, India. Uh, the idea here is really to uh, have awake people all the time, whenever you call, whenever your location is, which is really great to support all of your business. And all our teams are certified. They pass some exams. They pass some uh, uh, training uh, regarding those digital workplace technologies. So we are directly able to support uh, everything for you. And uh, cherry on the, <laughs> on the cake, uh, we have uh, also people that can manage your operation. Uh, what I mean by operation, it's everything related to monitoring, OS, software deployments. And we can speak uh, also about uh, jobs that you have uh, regarding your business application during the night, et cetera, that you can, we can monitor, we can uh, uh, really uh, uh, work on and uh, do some remediation about that. And the second kind of support, which is as important as the remote one, is for the iMac and Repair Center support. So iMac uh, 
uh, install, move, add, change. Uh, it's everything that you can do on site for a customer because we believe a lot of companies are centra uh, centralizing their IT now. Some headquarters all over the world are regrouping uh, the IT, but you will always need people on site that can help you. We have those people. We are doing that for several years for a lot of customers, and we want to propose this in addition of our digital workplace experience, which means that we can do everything from cabling in your office to repairing your hardware because we are uh, authorized service provider uh, for Lenovo. So we have a repair center and we can uh, provide a really good uh, uh, SLAs uh, regarding uh, hardware replacement. Uh, we can uh, move your PC, set up on site, performing uh, uh, troubleshooting if uh, we cannot uh, do it remotely. So we have everything that you need to maintain your local infrastructure. And now I will speak a bit about the governance. So what does it mean governance of a digital workplace? So it's basically uh, done by your service management office. What are they doing? Uh, briefly, service management office is composed of service manager. Those are, uh, I would say, uh, operational spoke. Usually you have a, a uh, contact with uh, uh, sales in the company like ours, but you have also a contact with a service manager. The service manager is really uh, for everything related to your patient, your business. So is here really to uh, be an added value on uh, your operation by uh, analyzing if everything goes well, proposing improvement, which is really important, improvement or optimization. Uh, really understand your business and propose new solutions aligned with your business. Uh, you cannot say, you cannot go with the service provider and uh, think, yeah, for the next three years, my solution will be okay because your business is evolving, the market is evolving. We can work also on financial optimization. So we have solutions that are probably more efficient, cheaper than they used to be. So the service manager is here to speak about those solutions and make our relation a long-term relationship. And of course, you will also check everything regarding uh, our SLA, so KPI monitoring, and you will uh, provide reporting, uh, invoicing, uh, and of course, you will work on everything uh, related to uh, operational processes to really optimize everything for a better experience for our customer. And uh, that's really what we think uh, the added value of CTG. So components of uh, technical components of a digital workplace. Um, I would say services that are really aligned with our strategy. So support, remote, local, and the governance around it. So thank you for this, uh, everyone, for this part. We spoke uh, really uh, <laughs> quickly about our solution because we wanted to give our partner, Axel, uh, time for his presentation. So as I mentioned earlier, he will uh, present some uh, uh, new solution from IBM. And uh, Axel, it's your turn whenever you want. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, hear me? we can hear you. Oh. All right. No? Don't see you. No, we see you. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. So let me share my screen. I hope something's coming. Is it? Yep, because perfect. Very good. And I hope that the bar on top will disappear. <laughs> um, thank you very much for having me, CTG, in uh, your uh, Luxembourg conference. Um, I, I think that my uh, colleague in Belgium uh, thought that I would be the person to do that because I'm normally speaking French. Um, and I was told for this occasion to not speak French, but to speak English instead. But um, mind you, I'm not far from Luxembourg. I'm sitting right at the other side of the Moselle. So I would like to talk today um, 
about data infrastructure for the digital workplace with the focus on infrastructure and um, especially cloud style rapid prototyping when cloud is prohibited. So when you're not allowed to go into the cloud. Um, I'm sitting in Mainz, but my workplace is Frankfurt and I'm the chief technologist for the EMEA storage competence center. So I'm caring about anything storage and left and right of storage. Okay, let's go to the client case. Data privacy centric DevOps rapid prototyping on a modern data infrastructure with low touch. And it was a case that is really close by because it is actually in Mainz. Uh, you may recognize this uh, because you certainly had one close by. Um, the university Mainz looked for a digital solution to run all their test centers. They have a big one in Mainz and they have smaller ones surrounding. And they were also looking for a kind of well, German-wide standardized solution for test centers. And there are three leading clinics who are doing this. So our solution was then uh, used by a number of other centers. It's a fairly large installation, this, this clinic. To give you an idea how um, the process works, uh, by the way, can you see the, um, uh, the title up there? Because I have a, a black bar in front. It's perfect, don't okay. worry. Very good. So this is a typical test center flow. A citizen makes an appointment, wants to come and be uh, tested or later be vaccinated because it's the same process. Then you have the visit, somebody scans, uh, somebody does the trick, uh, you get a digital certificate and then you can see the certificate. That was the basic idea. But by designing this, they sensed, oh, there's going to be a lot more around it and um, the reason I'm showing this, although it's a medical case, is that there are similar business flows in many B2C scenarios, like somebody wants to authenticate with your services, um, then runs some dialogue and data capture, and in a kind of loop, um, this dialogue information is being used and drives a reaction. There might be an AI service attached to that that uses some intelligence. And in the end, most likely there's going to be or not going to be a secure transaction. So this is um, the classic use case, which we can derive from that case. Now we had conflicting project goals really. It was urgent like everything around COVID, but cloud exposure was not allowed. So um, we had to come up with a minimum viable product in one week, which is really short. And um, the, well, the, the idea was of course to create this, uh, this workflow app and to show really the basics of the workflow app. But then we sensed, well, where should we host this workflow app? And the CSO told us, no cloud. This is patient data. You're not allowed to put it anywhere besides your own data center. Or to put it in a different perspective, the law says it needs to be inaccessible to non-local admins and obviously people who are not allowed to access the information. And um, well, that pretty much restricts the choice. Now, how to combine cloud agility with data privacy? We need cloud services because otherwise there would have been no chance to run a minimum viable product within one week. Um, and very often we see this will not cloud security model, which means um, the cloud operator sincerely promises that he will not access your data. And he will give you the, op the option to encrypt your data, to send it over there. Um, and well, yes, for a while, this encryption will be good. After a while, this encryption will be useless because as you know, we are now entering the age of quantum computers. So expect any encryption of today to be useless in five years, but the data will still be there. So the Gematic, the, the German, um, let's say company, which defines the, the standards for anything with patients said, no, no cloud, uh, even not encrypted, forget it. So the other security model is the cannot security model is where the cloud admin says, I do manage the services and I provide you the services. 
you see all the services, but your data is at your place. And there's a replication between the public cloud where the services are built and the local cloud where the services are consumed. And there's a kind of one-to-one -one replication, but it's one way the data cannot come out. There's an interest, uh, interesting uh, additional side effect. The developers of the company that uses this would develop in the public cloud and not in the private cloud, because there they have all the services. They just use anonymized data or pseudo data, just fake data. So they were using fake patients with fake, uh, well, certificates, etc. And that enables the developer to develop in a co-creation space together with others. In this case, it was uh, University of Medicine Minds and IBM together and third parties. We all developed in this space. And then we replicated everything locally to this installation here. And there it gets interesting for people like me who are caring about infrastructure. And we want to enable um, these cases where the will not security model is not allowed and go to this best of both worlds cases where the cloud satellite um, allows what we had otherwise seen in the left hand case cloud security. So Unimed Mines opted for this cloud satellite on premise using fake data for the development and then using real data only locally in their secure operations in their site that is acceptable, uh, accessible by their um, uh, administrators. It is only operated by client staff. Um, the trick here is you see this OpenShift. OpenShift is uh, the rising standard for when you have public clouds and private clouds and you want to replicate something in between that is not just data, but that is services, clusters, etc. Um, and OpenShift kind of levels this here. Now the ideal turnkey data infrastructure for anything with containers and anything about DevOps is now the first piece of gear from the storage portfolio that I want to um, uh, display here. Um, IBM Cloud is clearly a cloud uh, and cooperation, a digital uh, workplace, digital transformation topic. The cloud satellite is just as much so. Um, the code actuality is managed by IBM in the cloud satellite. And then comes the hardware. Now you can just opt to use your own servers, which you already have and run the satellite on them, but we can offer more. It's a pre-built platform called Spectrum Fusion, which we announced this year for satellite and for others. And it adds cyber resiliency and safety and a couple of other functions. So it works with the IBM cloud. It also works with, I call it any cloud because um, many cloud uh, services are based actually on OpenShift. And once you have that, the replication of services to another OpenShift instance is not always easy, but feasible. Let's call it this way. And if the cloud operator has built such a model, then most likely there will be a software or a design, a um, recipe that already exists. That makes it easy. Then. So we load the recipe on Spectrum Fusion, and Spectrum Fusion kind of builds a small in-house private cloud that is a replica of the public cloud. If you do not want to run this hybrid cloud um, kind of operation, then Spectrum Fusion can just run without any cloud. It supports Red Hat OpenShift container platform. You roll your own, you would use it as an application development space. In addition, we can also run VMware images and Microsoft Hyper-V images. So there's a small virtualization component. And we do that because, well, there is associated virtual machines that are not yet containerized in many workloads. And we want to have them side by side with the workload that is being controlled. I hope that makes sense. It is not intended to run 
a large bunch of VMware um, servers. It is intended to run a large bunch of containers on a distributed system. Now inside, what do we find? We have this integrated appliance, but there is also a data platform. And I would say it's a global multi-protocol data platform from cloud to edge. Because it's not just a file system that stores stuff locally, it's also a data management system that replicates to the distance, allows remote caching, etc. This is what we call spectrum scale. Spectrum scale also does erasure coding here, so it stores things on distributed media. We have workload steering with Red Hat Advanced Cluster Manager, which you will find in many clouds for, well, large scale workload management. It also works at small scale. So in this case, small scale means up to 20. I said there's cybersecurity, so safeguarded and or immutable copies, um, the ability to integrate backup, so Spectrum Protect is included, and there's a search engine on board, which is called Spectrum Discover, an extensible search engine, which you can um, enlarge by adding your own uh, um, formats and plugins for your own formats. It has format plugins for many, many already. And it also uh, enables a kind of a small scale um, uh, a data workflow based on metadata. Whenever a file gets created, we try and find out what is it um, and then what shall we do with it. In the simplest way, we just make it visible for search. And then we have all the classic things that you expect from a hardware piece, monitoring, auditing, call home. We just make sure that it works. If you know OpenShift, you might think that, well, OpenShift already comes with everything. What is missing in OpenShift? And here's the part that we're adding. On one side, we're adding storage services like, as I said, discovery and orchestration, like security, like migration from elsewhere, remote caching, and all the high availability stuff. And on the other hand, we have this platform idea. So um, simultaneous multi-protocol access. You can um, integrate data through one protocol and extract it through another. Um, connectivity with archive and tape or, or cloud or object storage could be a good archive cases. Immutability and encryption, all these things. And the ones that I've marked here are especially important for cybersecurity and cyber resiliency. So um, let's have a look inside. The rack is a 42U rack, and it starts with six servers. And each of the six servers has a minimum of two storage media. And they are not mirrored. Instead, there is a spectrum scale schemata of um, data distribution that runs on it. And every server does compute and does also storage at the same time. They are all NVMe media and the servers are all 1U high media. So there's also network equipment in there. And the maximum scale is then 20 servers and they would each have 10 of these media, uh, which makes a total of 1.5 petabyte total installed capacity. And there's also an estimator if you want to know the exact number. 1.5 petabyte is the rough um, sum of everything. Sometimes we want to have AI workloads also run by the system. So we do offer to you high alternative servers um, because there's no um, one new server with a decent amount of uh, GPU power inside. Uh, these are then too you high, and we restrict the number to not be too many. And there's something different. We can also combine that with an external storage pod if you need to ingest data from the outside. So imagine that a lot of data comes in, and you don't want to bother all the storage in the servers and the servers that should do compute with ingesting large amounts of data as a burst that can happen anytime. So we offload that burst 
to what we call an elastic storage server, an ESS, which is just a pod for this, um, for this data platform. Speaking of the data platform, it is also available independently. It's called Spectrum Scale. It offers this global namespace. So from whichever site in the world you look at it, a file that has a name always retains the name, even though inside it might be shifted to different places, like it might be downgraded from flash to disk or to tape because it's being rarely used. Or like in our case, the storage is in fact a distributed cluster with storage rich servers, or it could be transparently tiered to the cloud or whatnot. So this is completely flexible. On the other hand, we have the protocols with which we can show the data. And as you can see, all the OpenStack protocols, um, an object protocol, an HDFS transparency protocol, so Hadoop is one use case, and the classic ones, plus site interconnectivity is pretty complete. And as I said, this one, the yellow one, is what we're using in this case. Um, but um, again, there is spectrum scale in spectrum fusion, but it's not a must. It is something that can be uh, purchased separately if you're interested. Spectrum scale, if you want to play with it, exists as a free tier up to 12 terabyte. And for small applications, um, well, you can do nice things already. So you can try out all the stuff that I was telling you. There's nothing completely unrestricted. There's nothing missing in this free tier release. We're using Spectrum Scale ourselves in a wide range of products. If you know IBM DB2 Pure Scale, the name sounds like it. Yes, Pure Scale contains Spectrum Scale to manage the distributed data on media. SAP HANA on scale, yet another one. Spectrum Protect on scale. This is a pretty speedy and extensible backup environment. Then we have NVIDIA DGX on scale, which is also sometimes referred to as Spectrum AI because, well, Spectrum scale is really good for ingesting large amounts of data and then pushing it forward to some GPUs. The Elastic Storage Server is something that we derived from our flash system. So if you know the IBM flash systems, this is more or less the same hardware platform, but it is the it is configured as a pod for spectrum scale. It cannot be used as a classic flash system. So no block storage here. And if you're in the Z um, arena, you know this one, the VTL, the a virtual tape library, TS7700 is also a spectrum scale product. So eat your own bread, really. We're using it quite often. Um, the pods come in various sizes. So um, we've seen the small pod 2U high, but they also exist in large sizes. And um, maybe the large ones are not so, uh, uh, so much uh, in focus right now because the small one is so quick already. Um, 89 gigabyte per second in a 2U for a single client pulling the data. So that is, I think, quite a nice number. And honestly, for massive data ingest, there's nothing like it. Um, this is the benchmark. We added something addition, in addition um, for, for this uh, capability of uh, running AI data off these pods. Uh, we call that RDMA to GPU, and it's a cooperation with NVIDIA as the GPU designer. And what we do here is, um, maybe you know the concept of RDMA, remote direct memory access. You pull data inside the memory without the CPU constantly looking after it. Now we do the same for GPU. We do not send the data to memory as everybody did until now, and then send it from memory to the GPU because you will have a chunk of memory that is pretty much loaded and you will have motherboard bandwidth that is pretty much loaded. Instead, we send all the data directly to the GPU and we can run big models. This is becoming a very popular design in AI for, for instance, um, autonomous, learn, uh, autonomous driving. It could become the same for AI in banking applications. And 
as I said, there is a HDFS mode. And uh, the nice part here is that when you do some data analysis in a Hadoop style, uh, we can be that Hadoop cluster, but we can also connect to any other Hadoop cluster. Um, typically what you do then is you extract the data, uh, you load it on a lorry, um, uh, you insert it into the HDFS, and then you go to the way station, um, and then you find that the data has tripled or really quadrupled because you have it elsewhere also. Instead, what we can do here, none of all this, we just use the data as it is stored and HDFS transparency means that an HDFS cluster can see the data. And as you have understood by now, spectrum scale is parallel. So we can in parallel send the data to all the nodes just like a classic HDFS would do. And now we find the data only has added 30% overhead and not a factor of three. And we have seen petabyte large HDFS clusters that did profit from it. The largest scale installation, I said the smallest is the 12 terabyte. It fits on your laptop. And the largest scale installation is this one at the Oak Ridge National Lab. It's the Summit supercomputer. It's the same software, and it, we've just scaled it to match 2.5 terabyte per second sequential read or 2.2 terabyte per second random read write, which are, I think, demonstrating that we mean it when we say scale. This is not something that will stop working quickly. What are others doing with Spectrum Scale? There is a cluster of companies in the um, media area. So mostly this is TV and a little bit of um, uh, radio. They're using the exact same system for media management. And uh, you remember that there was this connection to tape archive to tape, they're using this extensively. Um, the car manufacturers are using the system because it can handle very large files and convey them quickly to CAD stations, but also um, simulations, AI training, uh, and running containers on top. So multiple use cases. This, by the way, is another automotive manufacturer, and they have based their whole company on Spectrum Scale as a hybrid data bridge so that whoever comes up with a good idea about um, a new project with AI, they have access to the data at once, once they are allowed to. Bosch is running a SAPANA cluster on that. The DAC, the German Synchrotron, and uh, the Forschungszentrum Jülich, they are running fast data acquisition. And then the really big irons, Lawrence Livermore, Oak Ridge, and the DARPA who are running massive AI training, massive parallel data analytics. Okay, um, how much time do we have? Uh, five minutes? Uh, yeah, five minutes. We, we have already some questions, so if you okay, can take, so I will say, five minutes, <laughs> not more, <laughs> and we can uh, switch to the question. Yes, uh, five minutes. There is a search engine in there, which, is also the file tagger and workflow engine. And the search engine looks a bit like this, Spectrum Discover. It runs automated cataloging. So whenever a file is created in the area that you're watching, it will scan the file content. It will try and understand what is in there so you can gain insight by combining metadata, like time and content could be interesting, or time, content, and user could be interesting in a certain combination. And then it's extensible because you can run various um, file formats and you can roll your own, write your own uh, analyzer. It is not restricted to Spectrum Fusion. It does run on others. As I said, it runs with Spectrum Scale. It also runs with Cloud Object Storage. And we have others that have certified for the connector. The connector is the thing that tells the search engine, hey, there is something, please have a look at it. And the other way, the connector can say, the search engine wants to delete this because it is not in the data governance schema. And this also works if you want that. 
Okay, um, this was just two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's okay, I think. I think we can go to the questions now. Yeah, definitely. Thank you very much, Axel. It was really interesting. And I think uh, your solution are really complementary uh, to what we we spoke uh, earlier. And uh, yeah, infrastructure is also evolving and uh, we are aligned in the strategy. Uh, let's go to the question. So uh, first question for Ricardo. What were your main challenges in implementing digital workplace solution uh, for your customers? Um, I think that the implementation part itself isn't that much of a challenge since we've had a lot of experience already in Luxembourg and, and deploying those digital workplace solutions. But what I'd say is my, was one of our main challenges is the user adoption and adversity towards moving to from a private cloud to the public cloud as well. Uh, but I think um, it, it has been proven now that your, your data is very much secured in the, in the public cloud space and that Microsoft is constantly making security improvements to ensure that data is protected there. Um, and we as well too on our side in CTG, we have authorization from the CSSF as well to, to manage and, and, and deploy uh, digital workplace solutions for our clients as well. And we take security very seriously as well too and the protection of our clients' data. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, next one is for me. How long does it take for a company to shift for a traditional workplace to a digital one? Wow, it really depends actually. It depends on the, the company uh, size. It depends on, uh, on a, lot of, uh, a lot of things. The first, uh, the first uh, you have to know is that if, we, if you want to go for a digital workplace uh, solution, uh, first of all, we have to audit what you have in place because uh, it's not like uh, we take everything and we put it in the public cloud or mix a uh, uh, hybrid cloud. It's really a customized solution. It can go fast. I think Ricardo, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, we did some migration in uh, two weeks for some customers, yeah, uh, small companies uh, like uh, five to 10 users, it's not really the amount of users that will uh, uh, influence, I would say, uh, the, the time we, we need uh, for, for this kind of migration. It really depends on, the, the, on your business, actually. It really depends on your business, where you are working till now, if you are already quite digitalized or if you are still traditional, you see a lot of paper, etc. because we'll need to change the way you are working uh, for instance, I think about uh, the example uh, uh, Ricardo mentioned earlier when uh, when we were all working uh, in the office and then we had co uh, the COVID pan uh, pandemic and uh, we had to work remotely. A lot of uh, companies, they invested in solutions like Teams from one day to another without really any plans. They just asked, could you install us uh, uh, this kind of solution? But if you have already something, we will have probably more work because we have to uh, rethink about what you did, uh, what you add, and what you need for your business. That's the key points uh, to, to move forward on this kind of solution. And usually, yeah, it really depends on the, your also your compliance constraint. Uh, but uh, I think uh, the biggest project uh, uh, where between uh, five weeks and two months uh, for for the biggest part after, yeah, you have probably some small migration, but it's usually like that. Yeah, I'd say the, the technical aspect doesn't take that long, in my opinion, no matter the, the amount of users. But I think it's just the um, the discussions and, and getting those prerequisites ready and stuff and ensuring um, what types of data needs to be moved and, and bringing about that culture and um, also involving the end users and bringing that awareness to them that there is going to be a change. I think that that is, that is the, the biggest challenge, but um, yeah, the technical aspect doesn't take that long. I think, yeah, yeah, I think it's probably about, yeah, somewhere about two months or maximum, I'd say. Yeah, definitely. Axel, you spoke about any cloud in your solution, so it means that you are working with all kinds of uh, public cloud for now. Uh, do you think the future for the customer is a, a solution multi-cloud or mono-cloud working with only one provider or with uh, several providers? Well, for the large clients uh, that we have, it is already hybrid multi-cloud. 
Um, okay. And that is obviously because there is some interesting service from that provider that you don't get here. And there's some interesting service here that you don't get there. So depending on the project and sometimes also on personal beliefs, um, you are on this cloud and on that cloud. And before you just let it uh, run all by itself, it would be a good idea to um, build a data governance committee and to think this through. How shall we manage that? How shall we make sure that costs are in sight? And do we have a common understanding of what we are allowed to do in the cloud and what we do not want to do in the cloud so that we have in this hybrid design also the local component? Yeah, I, I can add on this subject that uh, I had this uh, this uh, question one time for uh, by, by a customer. Uh, he, he was asking when uh, when I think about my emails, uh, which provider should I use? And uh, uh, he was on the Microsoft platform, so he had the exchange on premise. And uh, uh, I think you 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 have to think about the solution, the most appropriate solution regarding uh, uh, your your needs, because uh, it's not. You can of course deploy a uh, Microsoft Exchange server on. AWS, it will do the, the, the job, but uh, uh, in terms of maintenance, resources involved uh, to make it uh, run correctly, etc. Just think about uh, Microsoft 365 is really more efficient for this kind of uh, solution. It's uh, really, uh, it's it's uh, the, the basis of this solution, actually. It's, uh, it's made for that. So uh, definitely you won't find a solution that is more uh, cost efficient, uh, productivity efficient uh, than this one for this specific case. So I would say that depending on which kind of application, uh, what, what are the, your business needs, you have to think about all the solution. And yes. usually ask your service provider to, to guide you uh, through the different uh, provider and uh, of a public cloud uh, to really find the, the most efficient solution. Uh, well, we if spoke- there is, uh, If there is an IT um, uh, division inside the company or a couple of people that are uh, designing IT, it is a good idea to let them think about a standardized way of going to the problem. Because the non-standardized way is, well, I've just found out that some of my people are using this cloud service I didn't know until now. Yeah, and you're right. That can lead to a compliance problem, especially when you handle things like patient data where the law restricts what you're allowed to do, but the people involved may not know this because well they are not necessarily id people they're just using the services like we've heard doctors using whatsapp for talking about patients well nice but not allowed and, and this is something that uh, the it crew should think through come up with governance and come up with solutions and offer them and also go to partners like ctg uh, who have that, that whole view, that holistic view of all the solutions. You are absolutely right. It's so easy uh, those days to just go on a public cloud solution, put your uh, email address, put a password, and then you have access to some services. And uh, it can be a security breach, a compliance breach. Yeah. So re be really careful about that. And I have a last question for you, Axel. Mm -hmm. uh, we can see that more and more solutions are AI-oriented. What's your opinion about AI integration in customers' digitalization plan? Um, you will see that right now, AI is still something special because you need these special computers uh, that have the GPUs. And um, when you build AI models, then this is, you know, you need special people who understand this business. And then uh, you need to deploy the models. But um, I would like to share one final picture here, uh, if I may, ahead. if I may. And then you see that this will change before long. Look at this one. You see the image coming? Yep. Yeah, of course. This is the new Power 10 processor. And it is tiny. It is absolutely tiny. It fits between my thumb and my index. It's like this size. And when you know from the past the size that power processors had, they were more like this. You know, this one is a tiny thing, 
and it, it includes a full distributed AI math cluster. So the GPU is inside the CPU. And this is possible because this is now seven nanometer technology. I'm showing you this because I expect this to happen with all the processors. So what yeah. we did until now with the GPUs was, well, because math or distributed cluster math on a CPU was not easily feasible. Uh, the data was in the wrong place and so on. Uh, but I think it will be true for the x86. It will be true for any power processor from this one onwards. And it will also be true for uh, mobile processors, maybe more for the inference side. So uh, running AI and not designing AI. And this one is also clearly built for designing AI. So with this in the processor, the servers are no more special things, which I believe makes it much more affordable. We will see much many more solutions that just rely on the local processor to help you design AI um, models. And honestly, I, I, I hope this is going to happen because we don't have the time to care about everything ourselves. You know, somebody must do the work and it looks like pseudo intelligent work, but you know, it should do it autonomously. Of course, of course. If I, I can add on this subject, uh, we see more and more customers also going to uh, robotic process automation solution uh, in the in the companies. So uh, yeah, basically it's uh, auto automate uh, different action. It can be based on uh, AI. It can be based on uh, uh, human uh, interaction. You have a lot of possibilities, but we can see definitely that directly on at the business level, uh, the digital workplace is really a uh, uh, more and more uh, busy integrating this kind of solution uh, to make uh, actually uh, uh, workflows more efficient for the companies uh, uh, and reducing the, the time for doing, I would say, low added value uh, task. They right. really want to, to, to reduce the time for that. And, uh, and then people will uh, more focus on things that are interesting for us as well for the company and for the business, which is great. Well, currently, well, maybe let me add that currently, you're looking for solutions that, you know, I, I need to have somebody else do this. Uh, yeah. I don't have the time. Um, so it, it's a must sometimes. You're yeah? looking at uh, video images and understanding whether there is a fight going on and then alerting a policeman that to actually look at this picture because he cannot look at 1,000 pictures in parallel, obviously. Um, before long, though, I believe that things will flip around and then the AI is just much better than the human doing the same repetitive task. And that is the main reason why you will want to use AI. And I believe we will still also see this coming with cars. I'm not yeah. sure when, but I believe the AI driven cars will be better than the ones that we drive personally sometime yeah. in the future. I couldn't agree more. So I see that uh, we are already at the end of uh, this webinar. Uh, thank you uh, so much, uh, Axel. Thank you so much, Ricardo. It was really interesting uh, to share that with you. And uh, if you have any question, feel free to contact us. You have all the contact on the CTG website. It's, uh, if you have the question are for Axel, we will be happy to share them with, uh, with him. So don't hesitate to contact us and uh, we'll answer everything. Thank you so much and uh, have a nice day. Thank you, everyone. Bye. All right.